Hello again. Somebody commenting here this morning asked me to talk about the winter, winter solstice. Um, they mentioned New Grange, which is um, a prehistoric tomb in Ireland. Since I've written a book about prehistoric celebration of the two solstices, the longest and shortest days of the year, as practised in the area of London, I thought I would oblige. I'm sure people are thinking now, is there anything he, this guy has not written a book about? <laughs> Near the famous film studios of Shepperton, in the outskirts of London, a henge was uncovered of which hardly anybody has ever heard. Its columns were made of carved tree trunks the size of telegraph poles, and it was so arranged that the entrance aligned to the rising sun on Midsummer's Day. Here is a passage from this book, Unearthing London, the Ancient World Beneath the Metropolis, which discusses this and another site now buried under Heathrow Airport. Most of the prehistoric community, most of the prehistoric remains which are known in the London area are those associated with the dead. In chapter two we examine the Causeway enclosure, which is now buried beneath the M25 motorway. We also looked at Shepperton Henge. Both sites were intimately associated with both the living and the dead. There was certainly feasting and also deposition of food in specially dug holes or shafts. These ritual shafts were a way of sending goods to the world of the dead, rather like the depositions in the Thames and other watery locations. It is likely that the causeway enclosures were sometimes used as a mortuary, where decomposing corpses would be exposed for insects and birds to remove the flesh. The same place was also used for communal gatherings and feasts. So different is the lifestyle from our own that we cannot really grasp what was happening at places like Yeovany Lodge or Shepperton Henge. Imagine for a moment a clearing by the local river where rotting corpses of family members were left lying around for months. This would not strike many of us today as the ideal spot for a picnic, and yet that is exactly what took place. The remains of feasts have been found in the ditches, all jumbled up with unwanted human bones. Burials took place at these sites as well. It is plain that those who ate there were both enjoying a day out and also visiting the dead in the most intimate fashion imaginable, sitting for their picnic among the decomposing remains of friends and family. Long after Christianity had become universal in this country, traces of the cult of the dead were still to be widely found. Passed down by oral tradition, however, they became distorted and misunderstood, although still an integral part of the lives of ordinary people, especially those who lived in rural areas. One thing to bear in mind is that the dead were never seen as being wholly benevolent. They might aid a man, or they might just as easily hinder or thwart him. It was necessary to court them and furnish them with what they required if one hoped to enlist their assistance. These characteristics were remembered for thousands of years after the explicit belief system to which they belonged had passed away. They account for much of our current rituals and traditions for disposing of and honouring the dead. One other piece of a religious observance seems to have permeated the lives of communities in this country before the coming of the Romans. This is a veneration given to the sun and the heavens in general. There is good reason to suppose that prehistoric people in Britain worshipped the sun. We can certainly assert with confidence that they followed keenly the movement of the sun across the heavens, not just from day to day, but across the course of the year and even over periods of decades. There is evidence for this in the London area. Because modern London has obliterated all traces of many of the subtler and more elusive signs of early habitation and worship, we must look beyond the built-up areas for signs of anything of this sort. A great deal has been written about the alignment of megalithic tombs and monuments to various risings of the sun, midwinter, summer solstice and so on. Stonehenge has been particularly studied in this respect and many extravagant claims made for the astronomical data needed to construct this circular array of stones on Salisbury Common. 
Stonehenge was not, of course, the only Henge monument in Britain. It is without doubt the most striking and impressive, but other circular ditches of this kind are to be found scattered around the country, including the Shepperton Henge. Not far from this Henge was an Iron Age village known as Caesar's Camp, which now lies under a runway at Heathrow. This consisted of a cluster of roundhouses and also a curious rectangular building which has been interpreted as being a temple or shrine. It is an inexplicable fact that rectangular houses or huts were all but unknown in Britain until the Roman invasion. Long barrows such as West Kennet on Salisbury Plain are rectangular, but not domestic architecture. There are several theories as to why this should be, but any building which violates this apparent rule is generally supposed to be a place of worship. Caesar's camp is remarkable not merely for its shrine, but also for the fact that the doorways of all the huts, like the entrance to the Henge at Shepperton, face the rising sun on Midsummer's Day. This can hardly have been chance. Alignments of this kind are seen in places like the tomb at Newgrange in Ireland, where the sun at the winter solstice shines straight down the passageway and into the heart of the tomb. This sort of thing suggests a long history not only of observation, but of the recording of these observations. How these records were kept, we have no idea. From time to time, pieces of wood or ivory are found from the Stone Age with scratches or other marks, rather like tally sticks. It has been thought that these might have formed part of a system for keeping track of the phases of the moon and apparent movement of the sun along the horizon as the year progresses. What is beyond all doubt is that the Druids, inheritors and keepers of a tradition far older than their own Iron Age culture, were keenly interested in the movements of the sun, moon and stars. Classical writers told of their fascination with the heavens and some of the observations which they made. Julius Caesar wrote that the Druids were concerned with the stars and their movement, the size of the cosmos and the earth, the world of nature, the powers of deities. The Druids were aware of the Metonic cycle, which argues for a fair degree of sophistication in their measurements and record-keeping. This cycle, in which the orbits of the Earth and Moon and Earth relative to the Sun synchronise, can be used to predict lunar eclipses. It is uncommon in the Greater London area for an entire village to be excavated systematically. Usually, only one or two huts are examined. Looking at Caesar's camp and the Shepperton Henge make it seem likely that this kind of alignment to important movements of the sun might have been the rule rather than the exception, at least in the Thames Valley area. Observations of this sort and predictions about the movement of heavenly bodies would have been useful from both a religious and practical point of view. Knowing when the days were getting shorter or longer, and particularly the equinoxes in September and March, would have been helpful in deciding when to sow and reap crops. It would also have been helpful in fixing the times of festivals and celebrations. As the days shortened after the autumn equinox, there must have been a feeling of uneasiness on the part of many primitive people. Suppose that the days continued to get shorter like this, Suppose that the days just got shorter and shorter until they dwindled away to nothing and the earth was cloaked in darkness. This is, of course, the origin of our Christmas festival. This solstice was in many cultures a time for celebration and feasting. At both Stonehenge and Newgrange, the winter solstice could be calculated precisely. At Newgrange, the sunrise on that day was a key moment. At Stonehenge, it was sunset. The winter solstice falls on the 21st or 22nd of December. It took a few days after that point when it was clear that the sun had reversed its movement along the horizon and the days were indeed becoming longer. It is at this point, three or four days after the solstice, that we celebrate Christmas as our ancestors celebrated at the same time of year by feasting and drunkenness.